Brewing Conversation, live from Nicaragua. Dive deep into the world of coffee with co-founders of Twin Engine Coffee, Andrea Wolverton and Colin Ganley. Welcome to Brewing Conversation, Season Zero, Episode 3. My name is Andrea Wolverton. And I'm Colin Ganley, and today we're going to discuss Italian coffee. Or, my, my, my. Or what that even means. Just talking about this is, is starting to make me think about contentious subjects. Not something that's often thought about being quite controversial, but after living in Italy and then moving to other parts of the world, it is controversial. Yeah, so for two and a half years, we lived in Rome, in the beating heart of Rome. We lived in an area called Campo dei Fiori. It's a piazza in the historic center of Rome where every day of the week there's a vegetable market. Uh, it used to be a flower market, which is how it got its name, the Field of Flowers. Or was it because it was on the outside of the city? And it had I think originally it was not so... Back in the ain't earlier, much earlier, yeah. it I don't know. was Did, not as developed. Ignore what I said about how it got its name. But anyway, it's called the Field of Flowers. It's actually a, a beautiful old piazza in the center of the city where there are fresh vegetables every day. And it was really a nice place to live. I mean, and so the thing about living in Italy... Well, first of all, coffee is not pretentious. Coffee is a required breakfast, <laughs> lunch, dinner. Um, you don't exist without drinking coffee. I only knew, I knew very few people who didn't have a coffee, um, and that was probably by doctor's orders <laughs> because they've been drinking 10 a day for 20 years. Um, Hard to have a conversation without a coffee. Right. You got, you got to go have a coffee. And of course, a coffee, when you say go have a coffee, any time after 10 a.m., we're almost exclusively talking about an espresso or a lungo, which would be a longer espresso, or a macchiato, which would be an espresso with a touch of milk on top. So you needed a coffee to have a conversation, basically. And coffee was not... Uh... It wasn't an expensive luxury. I mean, it was one of the great things. It was almost thoughtless if you're of a middle class or upper, you know, economic level because it was 60 uh, euro cents to a dollar, typically for an espresso. Or, uh, to a yeah. euro. <clears throat> yeah, for an, for an espresso or something really similar to an espresso. So you're typically getting out of there for between 80 euro cents and one euro for pretty much any coffee that you want. I mean, I didn't get the big drinks. I always usually had an espresso or if it was early in the morning, a cappuccino. Well, and, that, and that's the thing. If you wanted more than uh, <clears throat> perhaps five or six ounces, you would get three. <laughs> so, I mean, it wouldn't be, there is no large cappuccino. It is right. a cappuccino is five or six ounces. And then you just get another one. Yeah. That, that's, one. that's more of an Austrian coffee when you start getting into putting like whipped cream and ice cream and all this nonsense right. in your coffee then. On a side note, the um, headquarters of Collins Magazine was in Vienna, Austria. So we, we did get a nice contrast of, of coffee cultures while we were around the continental Europe. Yeah. So as far as... But what, what is really interesting is that it's super neighborhoody. So, I mean, people go to their, well, it's got a bar, I mean, a coffee bar. So you go to the bar, um, you can have an espresso, you could have, if it's later, um, a beer or a coffee with a liqueur, but it's the bar that's open at 6 a.m. <laughs> until I mean, midnight in places, the little bar, it was just maybe just enough room to stand at the little bar and maybe three tiny tables and they were they were on every corner well and within a block of our house or a block and a half we had probably what like 12 14 different coffee bars oh yeah we, <clears throat> yeah and so we ended up going so on my way to work i rode my bicycle every day to uh work at the un and uh, the fao the fao and i would grab my coffee from one person and then call in <laughs> You had your whole other dynamic with where you like to go. Yeah, I had my boyfriend. Kind In Campo di Fiori. Yeah, he was uh, this great barista, which it had nothing to do with the coffee that he made. It was just that he was uh, my neighborhood coffee guy. I mean, he was just the guy I would go visit every morning when I took the dog for a walk. And all the people there loved the dog so much that they actually started giving the dog bowls of milk. Right, we had Duke the Weimaraner, yeah. um, who was quite the sight in 
the middle of the room. So when I would walk in there, they would give, uh, they would stop everything. They would say hello, be really nice to me. But then they wouldn't ask me what I wanted or serve me or anything like that. They would be completely focused on pouring a bowl of warm milk for the dog. And then at some point they would get on to talking to me about what coffee I wanted. Right. So. Which is great. I mean, it was it was an awesome experience. Well, it was just, it was lovely how approachable, easy, it wasn't about any kind of fancy art. There was some, um, I mean, so the word barista is an Italian word, you know, basically for barkeeper. And so it was just, it's the person who makes the drinks behind the bars. And many people had been working for a long time. They typically weren't young. Um, they were typically, typically male. I think most baristas that I ran into were males. I mean, there's labor laws in Italy, which impact these things. So, but, and then probably between 35 and 60, I mean, maybe 40 and 60, generally it was an older guy um, who was the barista, sometimes um, smiling, sometimes really gruff. <laughs> Oftentimes really grumpy. Oftentimes pretty grumpy <clears throat> until you had a, a relationship. And then once you have um, a relationship, then everything changes. Yeah. Uh, that, that was really great. And, and by the time we were leaving, you know, after about three years, it was it was really sad, you know, <laughs> go back and try to visit our baristas. So, I mean, we, we ultimately fell into this pattern that we're talking about, but but we also, especially early on, we really explored a lot. We went mm -hmm. around the whole city, and obviously we traveled in different parts of Italy and did the same thing there. We would try all the different, as many different coffee bars as we could find to see, you know, what are the differences, how it's served, how it tastes, mm -hmm. just for fun. This was before we even had the idea of starting the coffee company. And what you'll see is that there are like five major brands, three big ones, that mostly sort of, they don't own the coffee shops, but they uh, have like exclusive contracts with the coffee shops. And so you will you can tell usually by the, the cups that you see at a, at a coffee bar, which brand of coffee they're going to serve. So the Lavazza ones have the little blue stripe on them and the Illy ones have the little red thing on them. Kimbo. Kimbo, and yeah. A few different. I mean, what did not change was the proportions Right. The proportions did not. Maybe the accoutrement with the whipped sugar. I mean, I definitely had my favorites that had the better uh, chambele, the donuts. Um, but the, the proportions of coffee did not change. Right. And we should talk about that. But I, but I want to talk about this this other thing first, okay. which, which is just the in the Italian coffee culture, there are these really hard, consistent things like she's talking about, like an espresso is one ounce and a cappuccino is but et cetera, et cetera. All the drinks are very, very, very specific. And they're kind of perfect exactly that way. We really like them. The ratio of milk to coffee is at those percentages for a reason. Like it really tastes great like that. Well, and, and coffee in mm -hmm. Italy... Coffee does not grow in Italy. Right. It was coming in from the colonies. And so they've had several hundred years perfecting the preparation. Right. So that's what Italy does. is, And that's when you see an Italian coffee. What is that? Well, it's not grown in Italy. It's it's roasted in Italy these days. And um, there, there were some roasts, some very old ancient roasters um, near the Pantheon um, that were fun to go into. Uh, but it's important to know that it is not about where it was grown. It's about this preparation. And so they have a very specific culture of, of coffee preparation. Yeah. And so the Italian colonies were, were, I think, all or most all in Africa. And so, and they happen to be in countries that have been traditional producers of coffee, which is, of course, why you end up with a strong coffee culture in a place like that. Kind of like why England has so much tea um, after they took over India. Well, and Italy is the first country you come to by boat, right? As you're coming off the northern part most of likely. Africa continent. I mean, Sicily is... is some people say it's as much African as it is European, if you look at the genetic makeup of the people there and things. So Italy, Italian coffee, what what you'll find if you if you spend enough time in Italy is you'll develop a preference for which of those brands, whether it's the Kimbo or the Illy or whatever one it is. And so as you're walking through a big city like Rome, you can just kind of spot by the by the cups that they have on the table, which type of coffee they're serving or which brand of coffee they're serving and each one tastes different but it's not because it's not because of how it's prepared it's because of the farm because the taste of coffee is 
99% the farm, and then the roaster can either make it worse or keep it great, if it was great to begin with. And so it's, it's sort of all about the selection of where those coffees came from and to some degree about what the roasting is like, and then to some teeny tiny degree, how the barista actually adds the water to it. But so the Italian coffee culture, for me, there are a couple of important points. One is there's not a huge variety in your typical setting where you would, where you would find coffee. In cafes, there's one brand of coffee. And in supermarkets, there are there's more variety, but still, you know... Like, but it's to go home and make it in your mocha pot. Right. And that's the deal. Like, people are making their espresso in the morning in, a, in English, in a stovetop espresso maker, or um, Bialetti was the brand, the main brand in Italy, mocha pot... Um, but that would be the classic. I think. I think now a lot of capsules are making espresso. But um, you would have espresso. But I mean, coffee because the prices are so comparable and, and competitive. I mean, people are drinking a lot of coffee outside, and but they're paying a lot less. I mean, you just you can't charge the kind of prices that you see outside of Italy within yeah. Italy. Yeah, no, it, it, the prices are great in Italy. That, it's it's one of the best things about an Italian vacation is that you can drink coffee sort of without even thinking very much about it because right. it, it doesn't cost five bucks for a cup of coffee. It's right. it's one or, right. or less, which is one of the awesome things about the Italian coffee culture In is that it's a little bit guilt-free. I mean, it's sort of if you want to talk to a coworker, you go by their cubicle and you say, hey, you want to have a coffee? And it's not norm for, for a lot of people. It's not a financial decision. It's do I want to talk to this person in private? Right. All right. <laughs> right. right. And, and which coffee am I going to am I going to have? Because I've already had these three. <laughs> what am I going to have next? I was finding myself toward the end of the day at FAO having consumed a lot. Of, you a lot of coffee. Yeah, you had a, a, an experience way different from me because we discussed on a previous episode that my existence was a little bit more solitary. Uh, mm-hmm. than you are. So I was working from home. I would go out into the piazzas to work or I would travel to work, stuff like that. Um, but you were actually being influenced by a lot of local people or people who had lived there for a long time because you would go for a coffee to the coffee bar inside your office. Well, I mean, almost every meeting we had was having a coffee on the top terrace. So what was, when, when you first got to Italy, what were you, what coffee were you drinking? Well, so it's funny because I thought, oh my gosh, we've got to move. We're moving to Italy. I need to bring my coffee gear. <laughs> and so I brought, what did I bring? I feel like I brought a French press and I felt like I needed to bring coffee. And then I I pretty quickly converted, except maybe on Saturday morning to, I, yeah, it was a French press. But I I started going to the coffee bar and, and really enjoying that. Well, enjoying. What would you get? What would you order? So I would... What did you get at the beginning? What would you order? Okay, so I would order... What did you start drinking? Probably a Lungo, Uh um, which would be a longer espresso. So they they basically, they make an espresso the normal way, but then they just leave the machine to push water through the grounds even after. Right. So, but, you know, an Americano is this um, misnamed coffee that would bring it to about seven ounces or something so from like a one ounce espresso to a diluted seven ounces and so then I would be having a lungo mostly because I was the only person from the United States there were very few people from the U.S. working at FAO and um, there were a lot of stereotypes about what people in the U.S. liked and it was like oh y'all like what coffee that tastes like water and I was like of course we don't (laughs) we do not like coffee that tastes like water and I will drink um, <laughs> your coffee too. I didn't realize you had to drink like 10 a day. So I was drinking normally a, a Lungo Macchiato with just a stain of milk when I, when I first got there. And then as you spend more time there, what did you, Well, what and as I spent more time with? there, I started to also understand the rhythm of coffee. So a cappuccino is in the morning or a lot of people, cause I mean, they're having breakfast at work. So you go in Get a pan and Italian breakfast is just a coffee and a pastry. So um, it's a donut. Well, mine was a donut, but many others would be a a, a, a Danish. A, yeah, basically. a type of a croissant. Or, they were and, they, they were always like covered in sugar. Oh yeah. There was yeah. there was no croissant. There was yeah. There was no something protein. that looked Total like a croissant, carbohydrate. but was covered in in a like five millimeters of powdered sugar. Yeah. It was, oh man, those donuts are so good. The chimbo. Oh, so good. Anyhow. 
so that I understood the rhythm. So I would have a cappuccino in the morning, which was a six ounce drink, perfect proportions. Other people would have a a latte, which just means a little bit. Of, so like a 10 ounce cup of milk with a tiny bit of coffee because latte just means milk in Italian. And then around a little later in your second coffee, then I'd go for the espresso. And, and if I'd had maybe a little too many, I would, I would still get a lungo, but it was peer pressure. And also my stomach it changed. I mean, you just don't drink cappuccino, cappuccino. Chini. You don't drink them after food. You just don't drink them after lunch. So you'd get a, a real stink eye from the barista or your team um, if you ordered uh, a, a cappuccino after lunch. And so I, I got into into that rhythm. And if I really wanted to do some solitary work, I would secretly order an Americano and scurry off to a table where no one would see me, where I was not fulfilling anyone's stereotype. Because, you know, Americano is still pretty highly concentrated. That's funny. My experience was, like I said, really solitary uh, in in the sense that I didn't have a lot of influences about this, other than I would hear what you, what your experiences were like with coffee. But it wasn't a major subject of conversation for us, I wouldn't say. So for me, it was really more about... Cause the first coffee I ever drank was espresso. For when I was a when I was a late teen, early twenties, I never drank filter coffee or anything like that. I, the only time I started drinking filter coffee is when I started flying on transatlantic flights a lot, and that was all they had. And so I thought I'd try it, and I thought it wasn't too bad. But for the first say seven years of my coffee drinking, it was always espresso. In my dorm room in college, I had an espresso machine, and can't tell you why that happened, but it just somehow it did. And so when I got to Italy, I was very well primed for just continuing to drink espressos. Yeah, uh, you were pretty excited about yeah, that. Yeah, I was. I was excited about it. And so for me, I didn't try. I mean, I tried all the different variations, but I came back always to the classic espresso and cappuccino. That was... Well, I think the, the big surprise was is that in the U.S., what had been happening... So this is 2000... Uh, 10 ish and what had been happening is that there's just all of these varieties or all of these uh, additions um it wasn't so much that there's a variety in the roasted coffee it was more just additions and so in italy there were also a lot of preferences i mean don't get me wrong like people have real strong preferences about the temperature of their milk uh exactly like this amount of foaminess, skuma, or, or not, but the proportions never changed. So you just, a cappuccino was five to six ounces, that's it. Yeah. And so, but then there were a lot of preferences about that. And so that was fun to learn about, but there was nothing like a, a you could also, I guess, choose, um, you could choose full fat milk or uh, less fat milk. I don't know why sugar. you would choose a less fat milk ever. It's so much better with full fat milk. <laughs> yeah, now. it's true. I mean, if you could take it straight out of the cow, that would be ideal. But if you can't do that, then at least get full fat milk. Because that's, if you get just a small cappuccino, I'm not talking about one of those monster drinks that, that, that people get, because then it changes the way it tastes. But when you just have that small cup that's like just sitting three inches, the top of the rim is like three inches off the top of the table, and it, all it has is a real strong shot of espresso, and it's got milk filling the rest of the way up. It's a small drink, like it's it's really not that big. So you want it to be great. So you, if you get a great coffee and you put whole fat milk in there, it's perfect. I mean, it's, it's, it's perfect. Lovely. It's I mean, lovely. It, it doesn't really get better than that for for a coffee drink. It's it's true. I mean, the mix, the the blend with the coffee and the milk, and almost creating this chocolatey taste. It's so good. And it's totally lost in a larger. I mean, I don't even understand this twelve ounce cappuccino. Like I don't understand how you do it. But um, I mean, one of my favorite things that I discovered, and it wasn't that every bar had it, was the Shakerato. Yeah. My British friend, co-worker. At... Well, hold on. Let's say that for the very end. Oh, okay. 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 Because okay. I've, okay. I've got a dramatic story. Okay. Okay. So, and, and we should probably talk more about Italy than just our, our experience there. But, but I think this is interesting. The, the, my thing was to try espressos at all the different places. Espressi. Espressi. At all the different places to try to taste who had the better one, what I liked better, etc, etc. And 
the problem I got into was about a year or maybe 14 months into our time there. When you went to the hospital for over... No, I'm just joking. Well, almost. I mean, I had to stop drinking coffee because I had gotten up to something like 12 shots a day. And I was starting to feel really negative health impacts from having too many, too much caffeine in my And it's not that one espresso actually has that much caffeine. It's just that one doesn't normally drink yeah, 12 no, a day. Yeah, no, people don't normally drink 12, like, really strong coffees in a day and I just couldn't handle it I, I started I was uh, like I would get sweaty or shaky or whatever so I just had to I, I this is starting to remind me of the Cuban coffee challenge yeah different episode so I had to stop drinking coffee for a couple weeks and sort of detox and then I slowly got back into it and then went back to a normal level of like six shots a day or... <laughs> right in Italy when you go to detox it's coffee <clears throat> detox it's people don't really get uh, they don't really over you know they have a lovely wine culture and it's fun and social but detox is not normally about off alcohol <laughs> it's detoxing from coffee so that's when you go on your tea week yeah so tea was also a drug a lot, I think, but mostly as a as a detox option. So let's wrap this up by, why don't you talk about one of the coolest uh, coffee innovations that Italy offers, uh, the Shakerato. The Shakerato, and I have no idea where it comes from, but my friend James popped by my office one day and was like, hey, you want to go try something cool? And so I was like, yeah, and... So right across the, the bar, the coffee bar, right across from one of the main ones, right across from FAO, we sat down and he ordered this thing. And so the, the barista, he, he goes in the refrigerator and there's this glass jar of uh, dark liquid. So I found out it was pre-made. It was espresso that had been made and cooled. And then um, he asked me how much sugar. Well, actually, it would normally be sweet, but I'm not, not big on sweetness. And so he just puts it in a shaker with ice and just really gives it a, a fun shake and then pours it into uh, would be a flute, a, a Prosecco glass. So it was really popular to go have a Prosecco there as well. And so it creates this layer. It, so it looks like it's a dark on the bottom and this cappuccino foamy color layer at the top, just naturally from shaking the espresso. It kind of looks like a Guinness. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. It does. It looks a lot like a Guinness. I mean, basically exactly like that. And it's just so fun to drink. So here I am, you know, I think probably like two in the afternoon, and you can go over in your your Prosecco glass and have the Shakerato. There was no liquor in it. Um, just and espresso, it was just, sugar, and shake it over ice. Yeah, you didn't have to do sugar, but it was, it was so fun just to be able to, especially on a hot afternoon, it was such a fun way to have coffee. Well, thanks for joining us on this episode and hope you join us again for the next one. This has been Brewing Conversation with Andrea Wolverton and Colin Ganley. Thank you for listening. For more connection to coffee and Twin Engine Coffee, go to TwinEngineCoffee.com or email us. We'd love to hear from you.